Hello and welcome to the Detroit Black History Channel. In this video, you'll learn about eight black hospitals that were located in and around Detroit's cultural center between the years of 1918 and 1974. Most of those years were years of segregation in the United States. My name is Rita Dickerson and I'm a visual artist historian who creates works of art based on black history and culture. And in this video, you'll learn about the location of each one of the hospitals, who founded the hospitals, and how long each hospital served the community. You'll also learn something about the lives of the founders outside of their medical careers. This area is special to me because I grew up about a mile away and uh, as a child we could walk down Ferry Street and to Woodward and watch the Thanksgiving Day Parade and we could uh, marvel at the beautiful mini mansions and, and uh, see some of the black businesses on Ferry Street. Now, these were not the only black hospitals in Detroit. As a matter of fact, black hospitals were common throughout the United States during this period. And you may know of someone who had an affiliation with the black hospital, maybe a friend, a relative, an ancestor. Now, before we get started, take a second, press the subscribe button down below and the bell so you can be notified whenever I post a video, which I will be doing approximately every week. This one is the first of a series of videos about this community. Press the thumbs up icon and the share icon so you can share the video with others. Remember right now, subscribe, press the bell, so you can receive a notification about upcoming videos and new works that I'm going to create related to each one of the videos. So let's get started. What you see before you is a diagram of the Detroit Cultural Center and the surrounding area. And inside the Cultural Center, as it is called today, you'll find uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts, the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, the College for Creative Studies, the Detroit Science Center, and several other cultural institutions. Now, the left side of that square denotes Woodward Avenue, which is the dividing line in Detroit between the east and west sides of the city. And during this particular time, most blacks lived on the east side of Detroit. Perhaps You've heard of uh, Black Bottom and Paradise Valley communities, both of which were on the east side. Black Bottom was near downtown Detroit, which is about three miles away from uh, the cultural center. And then uh, just north and adjacent to Black Bottom was Paradise Valley. And then the cultural center area is just north of where Paradise Valley was located. Now, the distance between uh, Haynes Hospital at the top and Bethesda at the bottom was only about nine blocks and from left to right only about four blocks. So as you can imagine, uh, these hospitals were in a very small area and uh, they were community hospitals that people could uh, perhaps just walk to. In uh, 1920, the population of black population of Detroit was 4% and it was doing segregation and in the midst of discrimination and largely being barred from receiving medical treatment, black doctors and nurses created a community health care system by and for blacks, where they and their patients could be treated with dignity and respect, where internships, residencies, and training could be provided for staff and support jobs like maintenance workers and dietitians were available to the community. Here you see a picture of uh, one of the buildings remaining that constituted Dunbar Hospital, which was named after the playwright uh, Paul Dunbar. 
who uh, died in 1906 at the early age of 34. He uh, was a poet, a novelist, a playwright, and wrote several books of poetry, novels, short stories, and several build, uh, buildings today and schools are named after him. The hospital uh, is located, what was the hospital, was located on Frederick Street between St. Antoine and Bowlby and uh, just three blocks from the Cultural Center today. And you can see there's modern day housing in the background and it's uh, only one of two buildings on this particular block. And next you'll see a picture of the uh, steps of the hospital. And I'll, sh I'll uh, show you a picture that was taken on these very same steps about a hundred years ago in 1922 of 14 staff members uh, sitting on these very same steps and uh, some of these doctors would uh, later go on and form their own hospital. Dunbar stayed at this location until 1928 when it moved uh, further south and renamed its, its uh, hospital Parkside which stayed open to 1962. Good Samaritan Hospital shown here in the upper right hand corner was founded in 1928, the same year that Dunbar closed. It was founded by Dr. Ossian Sweet and by a nurse by the name of Bertha Lansbury. Both of them were Howard University graduates. Dr. Sweet stayed with the hospital for four years and in 1932, he opened up his own hospital called St. Alban General in another area of the city. There's no picture available of Nurse Lansbury, nor of the hospital. There's a uh, housing or apartment complex at that location now on Palmer and St. Antoine, about four blocks from the Cultural Center. Dr. Sweet is remembered today not because of uh, the hospital or for his being a doctor, but because of a murder trial that he and his wife were involved in in 1925. In the fall of that year, they bought a house on the east side of Detroit in an all-white neighborhood, and this was six years after the red summer of 1919, and uh, the same year as the uh, KKK marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., in full garb. One night, uh, Dr. Sweet and his wife expected trouble and invited nine of their friends over to help them if there was. And uh, there was uh, hundreds of whites uh, gathered through bricks, rocks, bottles, broke out windows while the police stood by and did nothing. A shot rang out from inside the house and one white man was killed and another one was wounded. The police arrested all 11 of them and they all were charged with murder and attempted murder. James Weldon Johnson, the secretary of the NAACP and the author of Lift Every Voice and Sing, the song that would become known as the Black National Anthem, contacted the very famous Clarence Darrow, who had just uh, completed the Scopes Monkey Trial in Tennessee and asked him to take the case. He did. Uh, the first trial was held in the fall of 25 and it was a hung jury. In April of 26, um, they all were acquitted. Sadly, between the trial and the opening of Good Samaritan, Dr. Sweet's wife and small daughter both died of TB. And after two failed marriages and financial trouble, Dr. Sweet ended up committing suicide in 1960. And here you see a picture of the house at 2905 Garland that he and his wife bought. And you can see on the left of the Michigan State Historic Site placard. The third hospital founded in this area was Fairview Hospital. On the diagram, it's just below Good Samaritan Hospital in the upper right hand corner. It was located on Ferry and brush just one block from the cultural center. 
The hospital was founded in 1931 during a TB epidemic in the city, and Herman Kiefer Hospital, which was the designated TB hospital in the city, didn't really want to take uh, black patients and would routinely divert them to black hospitals in the city, and Fairview became one of those hospitals. The hospital consisted of both of these buildings. The one on the right has been demolished, but the one on the left is still standing. The hospital was founded by Dr. Robert Greenwich and some of his colleagues. Dr. Greenwich was an immigrant from Guyana, South America. He arrived here in 1909, went to Cass High School and Wayne State Medical School. After opening the hospital, he decided he wanted to become a radiologist and would commute and commuted back and forth to Chicago to receive his training at Cook County Medical Hospital. When he got back, he opened up a uh, the Eastside Medical Laboratory. As I said earlier, I'm a visual artist historian, and I created a ceramic wall plaque based on this image of Dr. Greenwich. On the photo that uh, I'll show you of the wall plaque, you really can't tell, but the image of Dr. Greenwich is in relief. It's raised but you can still see the many uh, accomplishments that I've noted on the plaque. Uh, he was a radiologist and the founder of many different uh, institutions. This is a photograph of Dr. Greenwich in the Eastside Medical Laboratory that he founded. It was on Warren and Bowlby and just one block from where the Charles Wright Museum of African American History now stands. Dr. Greenwich had two daughters. One of his daughters' name was Roberta, and she became an x-ray technician, uh, got a PhD in education, got a law degree, wrote over 10 books, and uh, after being a widow for a few years, she married a widower by the name of Dr. Charles Wright, the founder of the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History located just uh, a block away from where his lab stood. So in effect, Dr. Greenwich became the late father, late father-in-law of Dr. Charles H. Wright, the founder of the museum. The fourth and fifth hospitals to be founded in this area were Bethesda Hospital founded in 1931 and Edith K. Thomas Memorial Hospital, founded in 1937, located on Garfield Street between St. Antoine and Bobian. You can see their, their location uh, just above Midtown on the diagram, and they were located about eight blocks from the Cultural Center. They were founded by the very same man, Dr. Elf Thomas Sr., a graduate of Meharry Medical School. Here you see uh, the cover of a brochure that was printed in 1938 about their fiscal year, 1937-38. At the top you see Bethesda, at the bottom you see both hospitals together. The running of the hospital was a family affair. Um, upper left you see Dr. Elf Thomas Sr the founder, his wife Lavinia to his right, who was superintendent and treasurer, son Joe in the center, director of Bethesda, son Elf Jr., director of Edith K. Thomas, and son Samuel, who was the business manager. Edith K. Thomas Ho Hospital was named after the couple's daughter who died as a child. Here you have uh, some of the staff members. The first five were surgeons. The top on the top row right, you see DeWitt Burton, who would later go on and found his own hospital, Burton Mercy. And the second row left, you see Remus Robinson, who became famous in the 50s and 60s as Detroit's first 
school board member and later school board president of Detroit Public Schools in his fight to end segre segregation in Detroit, school segregation in Detroit. And here you see some more staff members uh, and uh, some names at bottom. Together, there were 40 staff doctors and 30 consultant doctors and four residents. Now, during this time, collectively, both hospitals were known as the largest privately owned black hospitals in the country. And here you see um, 30 nurses uh, with two supervisors. The hospital during that fiscal year handled over 1,500 patients and the departments uh, were pretty much the same departments we have today. Uh, you have surgical departments, obstetricals, uh, urology, orthopedics, a TB unit. They also had a, a clinic there for uh, walk-in patients, uh, pe people who were not staying overnight. And they also had a library. And here you see a ward. Now, a ward was nothing more than a large room with many patients, um, unlike today where you will, e you will either be in a private or semi-private room. The hospital, both hospitals would stay open until 1965, and um, that location has been replaced by a parking structure located one block behind Detroit's Veterans Hospital. This is an interior view of the Cultural Center with the Detroit Institute of Arts in the center. The upper right, uh, you'll see the College for Creative Studies campus and the word Kerwood in red. Kerwood Hospital um, was located on Kirby Street between Brush and John R. The campus didn't exist at that time. The hospital was founded in 1943, which was the same year as the infamous Detroit race riot of 1943. And Dr. Salisbury, the founder, tried to get uh, on the staff of Women's Hospital, which is now Hustle Hospital, but was re refused because of his race. So he founded this hospital in this beautiful, very uh, luxurious neighborhood. Uh, the first two buildings were the hospital, and the one on the left in the back was the uh, was a became a convalescence home. In 1958, the Society of Arts and Crafts moved their location next to the convalescence home, and in 1967, they uh, decided to uh, decisions were made to enlarge that area, the entire area, to form the College of Four Creative Studies, which is there now. And Dr. Salisbury had to uh, move his hospital, and now you're looking at individual shots of the buildings that, that formed the complex. That's the uh, convalescence home. Dr. Salisbury was a native of um, Kentucky and a 1927 graduate of Howard Medical School. He uh, also found, founded um, Kerwood Mental Health Center at another location. And uh, he was a winner of many different awards. The Black National Medical Association named him Physician of the Year in 1968 and uh, General Practitioner of the Year in 1973. He was a uh, NAACP Fight for Freedom Award winner in 66 and 67. He was also a Booger T. Washington Businessmen's Association member. Uh, he was a member of the Economic Club, the Renaissance Club, and uh, very involved in uh, civil rights. This is a pastel drawing that I did of Dr. Salisbury. It's 12 inches by uh, I'm sorry, 18 inches by 12 inches wide. 
1967, Dr. Salisbury moved his hospital to the northwest side of Detroit on Petoskey and uh, Davison to a former community center. You see Dr. Salisbury on the left under the sign of the, the hospital sign, and uh, next to him is uh, Martha Lewis, an attorney who helped secure additional funding. She was also the wife of former heavyweight champion Joe Lewis. This is a shot of uh, the hospital there on Davison at Petoskey. It was the uh, one of the largest uh, black-owned businesses in the state. And here's a picture of the former champ with his wife at, when he was a patient there. The hospital closed in 1974. Dr. Salisbury passed in 1978, and his funeral was held just a few blocks from the uh, location of his original hospital at uh, the Cathedral of St. Paul's on Woodward and Warren. Today there's a plaque honoring him in the Detroit Medical Center. At the top of your screen, you'll see Haynes Hospital, which was founded in 1950 on Palmer Street between Woodward and John R. It was located just one block away from the uh, Cultural Center, and it stayed open until 1967, the same year as the Detroit Rebellion of 67. It was founded by Dr. F. Thomas, Jr., who was born in 1908 in Birmingham, Alabama. He attended Ferris State University and graduated from Meharry Medical in 1937. He was the son of Dr. F. Thomas, Sr., who founded Bethesda and Edith K. Thomas Hospitals. And Dr. Thomas, Jr. was the medical director of Edith K. Thomas. And after his father passed in 1956, he took over the administration of both those hospitals in addition to his own hospital. Here you see a pastel drawing that I did of uh, Dr. Thomas. It's uh, 18 by 12. During World War II, Dr. Thomas served in um, Liberia, West Africa, and headed a female medical clinic. After he was trained at Tuskegee Airfield by Benjamin O. Davis, the first African-American general in the United States Air Force. And you can see him here in Liberia. Liberia. And in the next photograph, you'll see him uh, with a couple uh, other men. Dr. Thomas is on the right. Both of these photographs were taken from um, the Detroit Tribune, a black-owned newspaper that was very popular in Detroit during uh, those years. Here you see a picture of the uh, hospital building, which was uh, under renovation and is now being inhabited by mostly Wayne State University students. The university is only a block away, and uh, it was my alma mater. Next, uh, you'll see uh, the doctor on the left with uh, Wendell Cox, a denter, dentist. Wendell Cox and his father-in-law, Haley Bell, also a dentist, founded the very first owned and operated black radio station in the country. And I have fond memories of listening to WCHB with Butterball, listening to soul music and Martha Jean the Queen, and later uh, Mildred Gaddis. The station was founded in 1956, and uh, in 1998 it was sold to Radio One under Kathy Hughes. Dr. Thomas uh, was involved in political uh, issues as well. In this uh, Tribune article, you see him being very critical of John F. Kennedy in 1960 during his presidential run because Kennedy had voted against a 1957 civil rights bill that uh, President Eisenhower uh, supported. Dr. Thomas uh, also owned a real estate firm. He purchased a seven-acre island in the Detroit River and named it after his wife Marion. He also owned a convalescent home in Jackson, Michigan. He was a member of the Detroit Institute of Arts, the African Art Gallery, now called the Friends of African and African American Art. He was a member of the first 
Human Relations Committee of the Detroit Police Department. Dr. Thomas passed away at a very early age of 59 in 1968. The eighth hospital founded in this area was Bailey General Hospital. It was founded in 1970 by Dr. Claude Young. The hospital was located on Ferry Street between John R. and Brush, just a half block away from Fairview Sanitarium, which had closed in 1961. It stayed open for four years. In my opinion, integration of public facilities was well on the way in 1970, and blacks could now go to white hospitals. Also, the building of the I-75 or Chrysler Expressway, just a few blocks away, destroyed several businesses, homes, and relocated residents, and largely decimated the community. Dr. Claude Young, pictured here, was a graduate of Western Michigan University and of the Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. Prior to opening Bailey General Hospital, he opened the 14th Street Clinic and later the Virginia Park Medical Center, both located outside of this area on the west side of Detroit. Dr. Claude Young was uh, the cousin of Detroit's first black mayor, Coleman A. Young, who served from 1974 to 1994. And you see a picture of him in front of the Coleman A. Young Municipal Building in downtown Detroit. Dr. Young was the personal physician of the mayor. There are no pictures available of the hospital. So I'm showing you a picture, two pictures of um, two houses uh, now standing on that block so you can get an idea of how the hospital may have looked. Dr. Claude Young was also the professor of family medicine at Michigan State University, the chief of staff at Kerwood Hospital, which we highlighted earlier. He was a Booger T. Washington Businessmen Association member and he was the former chairman of the board of the SCLC uh, organization, which was founded in 1957 by Martin Luther King and other civil rights legends like uh, Joseph Lowry, Ralph Abernathy, Fred Shuttlesworth, and Bayard Rustin. He also uh, hosted a television show called uh, health, the Bible, in you. He passed away in 2011. Hello again, and I hope you learned some new information from what you just saw. By 1974, all of the black hospitals in and around the cultural center had closed. Due in large part to the civil rights activism and federal legislation, that were passed in the 50s and 60s. In addition, Medicare and Medicaid programs uh, began in 1965, and those programs did not allow white hus hospitals to receive funding if they were segregated. So it was a financial decision for hospitals to integrate and to integrate their staffs as well. However, the integration of hospitals or of health care presented a, an unforeseen problem for African Americans. And that problem was the receiving of unequal health care. When all factors are considered like uh, the status, income, the age, the uh, severity of condition, the type of insurance, when all those factors are equal, the one determining factor of the type of health care a patient receives is race. Blacks do not receive the same health care that whites do. There are numerous studies online that you can access uh, that deal with this problem.
problem. So we as African Americans have to be very vigilant about our health care and what we, the type of treatment we receive. We have to vet doctors, insurance companies, and get uh, several opinions about any condition we might have so that we can be assured that we are receiving proper health care. Earlier I asked you if you knew of someone who had had a relationship with a black hospital, a friend, relative, ancestor. Do you or did you? Well, if you didn't, I can give you the identity of someone who did, and that person is me. I was born in one of the hospitals I discussed. I was born in the Edith K. Thomas Hospital. If you recall, I showed you a picture of the uh, delivery room and the nursery, and that was where my life began. The hospital was located where the, uh, behind where the uh, Veterans Hospital is now located in Detroit's Medical Center. So what you can do now is subscribe to the channel, press the, down below, press the subscribe uh, uh, icon, press the thumbs up icon, press that bell so you can be notified of upcoming videos because I've created other videos about this area that are very, very, very interesting and I've created new works of art for each video. And also press the share icon and share the video with friends and relatives. So don't forget, subscribe and press that bell. Thank you, see you next time. If you want to view more of my artwork or inquire about art you've seen here, go to my website, RitaDickersonArt.com. That's RitaDickersonArt.com. And on the menu, press Contact Me on RitaDickersonArt.com.